The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, a senior China Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, today we're going to be talking about ooh, debt sustainability. Not a sexy topic, but let's kind of rephrase that. Not call it debt sustainability, but call it predatory lending, debt trap. Uh, debt diplomacy, all of the different words or phrases that largely the Americans for the most part, but a lot of people uh, in the West and, in, and even in Japan where you were, have internalized as and taken for granted as the Chinese approach to what they're doing, not just in Africa, but around the world. And I guess the frustration that I have when we talk about the debt trap debate is that for the most part, the people who are using this language as a currency know very little about how the Chinese actually engage in debt financing in the developing world. And so they will kind of just repeat State Department talking points, and you'll see this journey that happens with the debt trap narrative. It starts from largely a U.S. government official, though not exclusively. It's then picked up by the news, and news and journalists oftentimes restate that as if it's a fact, that debt trap is a proven, known fact of life. And then social media oftentimes picks up the news coverage, and then it just kind of makes it into our body politic and into our discourse and the everyday language. And all of a sudden, then we have this debt trap narrative that the Chinese, who should be criticized up and down, do not respond to. So what ends up happening is we have this very faulty, very partially incomplete uh, discussion about Chinese debt in places like Africa. And it's very frustrating to me, Kobus, because again, so few people actually know the substance and the merits of the discussion. Yes, I think in, in you know, in think tanky kind of circles, the the debt trap narrative, as we saw it in in 2018, um, has largely, I think, been debunked. I think many people, you know, would, would now acknowledge that that narrative, the idea that China, you know, on purpose in debt sp- you know, poor countries in order to then stay, you know, seize state assets or gain some kind of leverage over them. That, I think that narrative has largely been debunked in, in scholarly circles anyway. You still see it kind of circling in media frequently. Um, but, you know, the, the debunking doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't help us with the larger issue, which is that debt sustainability, debt sustainability, even if you don't believe the debt trap narrative, debt sustainability is a really big issue. And it's increasingly an issue that is coming to define the China-Africa relationship and the relationship between Africa and the rest of the world. You know, so, so it's one factor that factored into the fact that uh, the Japanese government didn't, didn't announce a funding target at TICA this year. Um, you know, so the idea that we saw in like 2014 or so where that the financing of African projects is an unalloyed good and everyone should just be praised for the more financing they do in Africa, the better. That narrative has really turned. Um, and the idea that more debt is necessarily a good thing is, is seriously being questioned. Yeah, so there's a group of African countries, about eight to ten, that are in very, very serious trouble. And this came into clear focus about Uganda just last week, in fact, and this was in our weekly newsletter. I did a breakdown on Uganda and and Nigerian debt. And it basically came to the conclusion, this was a, a report done for parliament that said Uganda now has crossed the point where it can no longer afford its debts. It, it is simply not generating enough money to pay back its debts. So think about this, 42.45% of Uganda's total debt repayments went to the uh, PTA Bank, which is the financial arm of the common market for Eastern and Southern Africa, known as COMESA. Uh, The China Exim Bank was the second largest recipient of Ugandan debt repayments with 18.72%. And this is one of the things that we see, and this is again where my frustration comes in, is that oftentimes in places like Sri Lanka or even in Nigeria where the debt trap argument has been used, Chinese debt doesn't exceed more than 10 to 20 percent. So this whole narrative of the Chinese are trying to trap based on 10 to 20 percent of an ownership of debt is it's a little bit shaky and whatnot. Again, let me just cut people off at the pass. I am not saying any of this 
none of it to defend the Chinese. I am more offended by the shortcomings in the argument than I am about the facts. So forget the fact that I'm, this is not a defense of the Chinese. So with that in mind, let's get to the topic of debt sustainability. Now, back in April at the Belt and Road Forum, the Chinese issued this new debt sustainability framework for the first time. And this was the country's approach to debt and development that has first time been articulated in an official document in English. And so that gives the indication that they're really trying to communicate to an international audience. And this, in my reading of it, was the first time that we've seen an official response from the Chinese government about the issue of debt sustainability. And then Chinese finance minister Liu Kun, he then went on to encourage all of China's financial institutions, Belt and Road signatories, and international agencies to use the framework as a way to improve overall debt management. So this debt sustainability framework is really very, very important to understand, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And so there's a very important article that came out on the on the blog, Panda Paw Dragon Claw, and it's a fun blog. If you haven't seen it, go to Panda Paw, Panda Paw Dragon Claw, say that four times, and it's all about kind of sustainability and climate and debt issues in there. And uh, it was written by Ma Xinyue, who is the China Research and Project Leader at the Global Development Policy Center at Boston University. And Xinyue joins us for the first time on the program from Beijing this afternoon. A very good afternoon to you, Xinyue. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful to have you. You're going to help us navigate our way through this very complicated issue on the debt sustainability framework. Let's just start to say, what is this document and why is it important? Mm, so let's say this document is mostly in line with um, an IMF World Bank document um, that first came out in 2002 and then um, was reviewed and updated in 2017, um, a document called the Debt Sustainability um, Framework for the Low-Income Countries. Um, so this original document um, from the World Bank and IMF um, is mostly a guideline for their operations um, to guide their um, their landings um, with, within the International Development Agency, so the World Bank arm that does concessional loans, and the IMF um, to give um, debt relief for the countries that are um, in debt sustainability risks. Um, so... The, the document that China issued is mostly in line um, with this document, and it also says it is the framework for low-income countries. Um, and then, of course, the BRI is not just for low-income countries, but um, they both have the same scope. And the only difference um, is that um, this Chinese document um, has a, an, an additional new borrowing shock um, stress test. So I can go into the structure of um, this debt sustainability framework. Um, so firstly, it um, assigns different thresholds of um, multiple debt indicators for different groups of countries um, according to their debt carrying capacities. Um, and then it provides risk ratings uh, based on this evaluation of the baseline proje uh, projections. Um, and then it does some stress tests relative to the thresholds um, combined with some um, indicative rules and um, staff judgments. Um, so it is basically a pretty comprehensive um, risk evaluation for the debt sustainability. Um, and then even though we say that most scholars, I would say, agree that um, there is not a certain debt threshold that is health, absolutely healthy for all countries, but to operationalize it, this is what the World Bank and IMF does. And basically, this Chinese document um, replicates the framework of this, um, of this document. So I can say most of the indicators and the data are already out there, and the World Bank also offers... Um, the, the Excel sheets even to operationalize it. So um, if the, this, China, this Chinese document adds one more indicator um, in the stress test um, element, then they can add it to it. Um, so I would say it's making use of something that is already out there. The, the, the dominant narrative when this document came out was uh, a kind of a takeaway 
that I saw circulated in the press that essentially China doesn't care that much about national debt sustainability, about the debt sustainability on a country level and more on a project level. So that even if a country might, the, some of the country's indicators might look like it doesn't have very high debt sustainability, if the project itself seems sustainable and, and paybackable, then the, that would still be okay. Was that a complete kind of misunderstanding of the actual document? Um, in the end of the day, I think this document is more on a country level. So it, it helps you identify the, the debt sustainability or um, the, sustainable, the debt default risk level um, of a country. So then you can, based on that, you can, you know, help your judgment of whether you're doing another loan to a, ris a, a risky country or a country that does not have that sustainability anymore? Or are you still able to do it? Or are you going to do a concessional loan? Or are you doing to, going to do a grant rather than a commercial loan? So based on, based on the framework of the World Bank and IMF framework, this is what they do. And then it also guides all the, um, all the lenders um, and the and the borrowers whether they should accept a new loan. Um, so it is still it is not so much on an operational level, I would say. Let me just clarify for those of our listeners who are not familiar with a concessional loan versus a market loan. A concessional loan is and correct me if I'm wrong here, Xinyue, is a very very low mm. interest, oftentimes with very long uh, interest payment holidays, sometimes less than one percent, whatnot. And this is really. The, the benefit of borrowing money from China, which is in China does use a lot of concessional loans, although there are interest rates and you do have to pay back the interest, it's much lower than a market rate loan, which can be as high as 9, 10, 15%. And that's why the concessional loans are so important. Um, mm -hmm. Forgive me, Xinyue, and I'm very, very sorry, mm -hmm. but I'm still not understanding why this is important. Can you just explain it in the sense that does this move China's lending more aligned with what the World Bank and the IMF are doing with international standards, or is there something fundamentally different about the way that the Chinese are going to lend according to the debt sustainability framework document that came out in April? Well, according, according to my understanding, I don't think it's vastly different. There is only one additional indicator, basically um, – if this country is going to borrow more, then it also counts it into the stress test scenario. Um, but in the end of the day, it is it is a high level um, document or guideline, um, and it is very much in line with the World Bank IMF document. So, I, in my understanding, it's just the Chinese government bringing this kind of a framework into the attention um, of the Chinese lenders, which um, probably was not really. Um, cognizant of the fact that there there is such a framework out there, um, and and to be honest, I think most of um, the indicators were the risk ratings are already out there, um, provided by IMF and the World Bank. It's just something that I, on the one hand, in res uh, in response to all the criticism, and on the other hand, um, you know, trying to hedge or manage the risks of all the landings that China is doing overseas. Um, it, is bringing it, it, is, it is bringing this framework into the atten to the attention of the Chinese actors. Kobus, I'd like to pick up a topic with you very quickly here. And this is a, a distinction between the IMF approach and what the Chinese are doing that was made by Johanna Johann Malm, who is a longtime China-Africa scholar with a lot of experience in debt sustainability, particularly in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, back in August, she wrote a paper for the China Africa Research Initiative on their blog uh, entitled Ch China's New Debt Sustainability Framework for the BRI. And there's one point that she made in this, that the Chinese make a distinction between a project and a country. And so she writes here, a country in debt distress can still take up loans from China if the individual loan back project is commercially viable and if the borrower is able to service its debts, this statement represents a sharp contrast to the approach of the IMF. So even though, Kobus, it looks like, as Xinyue is telling us, that the Chinese are moving more in line with IMF standards, there's still a fundamental difference that a country like Djibouti, which has a massive amount of debt to the Chinese – 
not sustainable by most people's standards, can still take on more debt from the Chinese because specific projects are deemed viable. Do you think that is going to be a subtlety that will be understood by the outside world? Well, this is the this is the distinction that I was also talking about in my previous question. You know, it's like it's how to exactly understand that. The reason I also find it difficult to understand is that in reality, a lot of these projects would be state would like the governments would be putting out these tenders, right? So like, I'm not sure like what the real distinction is between a project and. Uh, the, a national debt situation when in a lot of cases the government, the national government would be the one in whose name the, the debt is taken out, right? I mean, uh, the, then then the distinction between project debt or project-related debt and national debt starts fading. Shinwei, do, do I have that correct? Mm, I would say by by principle, the debt issue is a dynamic issue. So no one is expecting a country or any entity to pay back all the debts overnight. So as long as, so by principle or simply put, um, as long as the the increase of your debt um, year over year is not exceeding the rate of the the growth of your primary balance, then you're good. And in most of the times, it doesn't have to be, you know, even if you have one year that um, your your balance goes to negative, then as long as over time it, you sustain it, then then it's fine. So um, on the one hand, I don't think it's, it's a China issue or, or IMF or World Bank does not think that way. Um, I think this is the gen- this is the common you know consensus. Um, but um, but on the other hand, this comes down to the technical issue of you know, whether um, the country or the investor or the sponsor of the project is able or have the capacity to really manage well um, the the project and make sure that it brings the economic um, growth and it also brings the, the tax revenue for the government to make sure that um, its primary balance is going to grow. And the and the you know the economic strength of the country in general is is being contributed um, from the project or by the project. Um, so in the end of the day, um, this is this is I don't think this is unique to China or um, IMF does not do this way. Um, this is the common sense, um, but definitely a high a high rate of um, debt debt over GDP is an issue and especially for countries that have probably lower institutional capacity um, it is an issue and it it requires uh, multilateral engagement i would say support for this podcast comes from the africa china reporting project at wits university school of journalism in johannesburg the acrp provides reporting grants workshops and other professional development opportunities for both african and chinese journalists Follow the ACRP on Twitter at Vits China Africa or visit africachinareporting.co.za for information about grants and upcoming seminars. So you're talking about this balance of payments, which is really interesting. And it's the, it's the part of the discussion that I think a lot of people on the outside looking in just don't seem to understand. We're talking about a lot of countries, not just in Africa, but in Asia and South America as well that are largely commodity exporting countries whose fortunes rise and fall with global commodity prices, oil, iron, ore, pick whatever you want. So what ends up happening is in good times, they're using that oftentimes as collateral against those loans and that's a way to secure the loans and it all makes sense. When oil prices go down to $45, $50 a barrel as happens, or if iron ore prices, as we've seen with Zambia, go down, then all of a sudden these, the balance as you talked about shifts. And I guess what a lot of people don't understand is, okay, we understand why the countries are taking the money because it's easy, it's low cost, this is the one chance to do it, but that the Chinese keep giving it. And this is what fuels the debt trap narrative because financially it doesn't always make sense. So what are the Chinese up to is what a lot of people think. It must be for some other reason, a political reason. And that's when we saw this movement towards the, well, they're going to grab the Habandota port. They're going to grab the port of Mombasa. They're grabbing land in Tajikistan. That makes sense to me because nothing else makes sense. 
Well, as Cobus pointed out, that's now largely been debunked for the most part. I disagree with Professor Deborah Braudigam, who says that a lot of the loans are 100% economic. We had her on our show. She talked about this. I have enormous respect for Professor Braudigam. But on this one point, I do believe that there's a thread of politics that goes through almost everything China does. It's just the nature of the way that the Chinese government is set up. And maybe the, the, the political part of this is not that they want to grab a port. And that's where I think the Americans are just boneheaded, is they keep going down this line that they're going to come in and extract and take something away. What they want is influence. What they want is to be able to tell you what to do, almost in that tributary type relationship that China's historically had in Asia, in this part of the world where I live. So is we're trying to understand how does this all fit together on the debt sustainability? Because economically, it doesn't all add up. Do you also have that sense? Or am I is there something that I'm missing here in this, in my evaluation of it? Well, let's say nothing is septic um, of politics. So whoever lends money, whoever holds debt over another entity has certain political rent over the other party. Um, so I, I do agree there, there must be some political, you know, um, intention or strategic thinking um, behind everything. And there is this um, economic statecraft theory um, that explains um, Chinese overseas finance or investments that um, China uses um, all these economic activities um, as a tool of um, expanding is, is a political influence. And there is, of course, there is no way of justifying it or um, or denying it because um, in the end of the day, all the actors are, you know, the, are people in the end of the day. And it is really hard to coordinate um, any single project. So I would say any single project, any single finance um, financing contract is, is different and is influenced by all the different ministries that are trying to have a regulation over it and all the banks that are trying to make a profit or avoid certain risks out of it and all the people who are trying to secure their deal and all the people who are, you know, the, the, po the politicians on the, um, in the recipient country that is trying to, you know, win is his, his or her um, political um, weight over uh, through through a certain projects or um, you know proof that um, another another politician is you know over relying on Chinese influence. So um, this is this in the end of the day and on a micro level, um, things are so hard to coordinate. So probably there are things that are set out to be a certain way, and in the end of the day, it doesn't serve it that way. Um, so, um, I, that, that's, that's my thinking about this debt trap diplomacy theory, um, because you cannot prove it or deny it, but in the end of the day, it's, it's so hard to coordinate. So it is a sporadic, um, it, it is, it, it is sporadic actions that add up to something that, um, would have a certain impact. Um, either in people's perception or in in the actual impact. You know, as you mentioned earlier, um, the the document, you know, hasn't necessarily, you know, been operationalized yet. Or like, you know, so in the first place, I'd like to ask you how how you think it's going to affect actual Chinese lending from you know Ch Chinese uh, you know financial institutions. Um, and you know, in, in, the, in the the context within which I ask, I'm asking that question is the you know the, always the narrative that we've seen in China Africa has been this narrative is coming very strongly from African governments saying like oh you know if you lend from the World Bank they make you jump through a thousand different hoops it's a lot of a lot of feasibility studies it takes years and frequently there are there's a whole bunch of of other conditionalities linked to it um, including things like human rights stipulations and, and stuff like that and the Chinese are no strings very easy very efficient. Um, do, do you see that you know? Do you see Chinese lending starting to change and becoming having more strings and, and, and more feasibility studies and moving more for that reason in the kind of IMF World Bank direction? 
I think according to my limited contact with、um, people from the Chinese development banks,、um, I do feel that they they are feeling the pressure,、um, and、um, in their capacity, you know, responding to、um, these. Um, accusations or criticisms.、Um, so the, I I do hear more talks about、um, social and environmental safeguards and、um, you know the green aspect of、um, of projects and being more risk averse and doing the feasibility studies and having third parties to、um, do the environmental social、uh, analysis.、Um, so. Yes, I do think、um, they are、um, rising to the awareness of it, and we do see、um, actually in terms of volume,、um, at least in in the sector that I follow, in the energy sector,、um, Chinese、um, development finance it has been、um, slowing down since two thousand and seventeen, and before that it has been、um, it has been rising, and even before、um, BRI was put forward,、um, so. Yes, I I do feel there is such momentum, but on the other hand, there is、um, still the lack of transparency and、um, you know enough regulations that I do hear them calling for、uh, more regulations from,、um, for example, the China Banking and in- Insurance Regulations Commission.、Um, but in the end of the day, I I don't see、um, enough. Action and I do believe it takes time, and I do believe they're learning their lessons.、Um, but there, there is still so much to be done. It's interesting that you brought up the issue of, trans, of transparency because that, to me, that's the, the the baseline issue here. I mean, really, that is the baseline issue. You and I had a, a talk、uh, a few weeks ago, and I and I made the point that says, you know, the Americans in particular, but the Europeans as well. Really want to push the Chinese to be more transparent, and they will use that as one of the big clubs that they hit the Chinese over the head with, saying that their loans are opaque and the lack of transparency is why countries shouldn't partner with the Chinese. I think they're absolutely right, a hundred percent. However, you and I both know that if they opened up their their loan programs for the world to see,、uh, and if there was something very very slight out of order, boy, the Americans in that White House would be on them like you know white on rice. I mean, just so fast they would be pounding them. So the Chinese don't feel necessarily that there is a motivation for them to be more transparent. But at the end of the day, the lack of transparency is what fuels all the suspicion and the skepticism. So everything else that they do on environment, on climate, on debt sustainability, whatever it is, without the transparency, you're going to have people who are going to question the Chinese motives. Uh, Kobus, you and I, when we were talking to Agri Mutombo, the diplomatic affairs writer for the the, the Daily Nation in Kenya, he brought up this issue of transparency and the suspicions that even the local Kenyans have towards their own leaders and the Chinese. So the core issue is transparency, and I'm curious. You're in Beijing right now. You're attending a lot of forums and seminars with other scholars and whatnot. Are people actually talking about transparency? Are some of the interactions you're having with the development banks, or is this just too big of an issue, too sensitive of an issue right now that it's not really on the table?、Mm, actually, I I hear a lot of positive、um, responses or discussion、um, about the standards and the greenness of the investment, especially overseas. Um, and I do hear people talking about transparency from CBRC, from the banks themselves.、Um, but I think in terms of action, it is it is not yet、um, turned into action items.、Um, so I, I I think what we can do is just keep talking about it and drilling into it,、um, and then let's let's hope that one day they're they're actually going to, you know. Do something with it, yeah. Yeah, it's it's a very interesting issue.、Um, I think the you know the the pressure for transparency、um, from the African side frequently also is very indicative of a kind of a lack of trust between African populations and African governments. You know, like I think a lot in a lot of cases that、uh, that push for transparency comes from. Frequently in Africa, from civil society organisations trying to see what kind of 
padding of deals happened from the African government side, um, which obviously, you know, kind of makes the transparency issue a, a more complicated one because it, it has a lot to do with with African habits of opacity as well, rather than just China on the Chinese side. Um you um in, in in a recent other article that you that you um co-published um you pointed out that that chinese uh, investment in overseas um uh, power generation especially in you know in, in in power plants overseas have really fallen between uh, 2017 and, t- and 2018 um and uh, you know i wonder if you could unpack a little bit like why did we see that sudden rapid kind of diminishment in chinese uh, funding for overseas power plants mm, i think it is a systematic issue um the economics um itself um, of China and um, of many of the emerging markets, developing countries, is slowing down. And um, in this certain, um, you know, sector of power generation, um, you know, they have, it only makes sense if it keeps up with the economic growth of a certain country. And um, for the preparation of project, it's take, it takes time. Um, so, with the quick growth of the past years, um, I do think um, probably it is slowing down because you know the the market is just kind of reaching the point that um, there are not so much more um, projects out there, and also mm, from within China um, the regulations for capital outflow and um, just in general for risk management. Um, especially for the China Exim Bank and China Development Bank um, has been tightened and there has been um, several regulations that has been published recently um, talking about um, regulating the over, especially the overseas operations of, of, the, of the banks. Um, so um, with all these factors adding up and um, with the you know, I think the risk portfolio that these banks have already accumulated, it is already quite a big portfolio, and um, both in terms of finance and in terms of risks. So um, I, I, I do think it is a rational um, act for the banks to actually slow down by this point. Um, but on the other hand, it's, it is also a challenge to what we perceive the role and the, and the merits of Chinese development finance because it has been, you know, um, by perception more risk tolerance, uh, risk tolerant, um, and it has it has acted or um, at least in in the two thousand eight and nine um, global economic crisis um, we can see that Chinese overseas finance has really spiked over that time. Um, it has acted. Um, in, in a certain way um, as a market corrector or a counter-cyclical um, actor uh, in development, bridging all these gaps. But um, with these banks being more risk-averse, I think it is also challenging this kind of a structure. Ma Xinyue is the China Research and Project Leader at the Global Development Policy Center at Boston University. Uh, she wrote this a fantastic essay, as I mentioned at the top of the show, on pandapawdragonclaw.blog, assessing China's most comprehensive response to the debt trap, the Belt and Road's debt sustainability framework. And she raises the issue there between, is it a debt trap or a creditor trap? Hmm, there we go. Go find out her, uh, her response to that. It's a really, it sounds wonky and it sounds really kind of technical. It's actually not. It's readable for a layman like me. Uh, sometimes these, you, you academics, you guys write in ways that we don't understand. That's not what this is. So I really recommend that everybody go check out, uh, again, at pandapawdragonclaw.blog. So Xin Yuan, thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedule in Beijing this afternoon. We really appreciate your time. Uh, if people want to follow what the Global Development Policy Center is doing or you, are you guys available on social media? Um, we are. We have Twitter and Facebook. Um, and for the Chinese, we have a WeChat um, subscription. So um, just search for the GDP Center and you'll find us. Great. And we'll put links to that in the show notes in, on, on all of the various pages that we have it so you can connect directly with, uh, with what GDP is doing and also what Xinyue is doing. Xinyue, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it.
Thank you so much. The pleasure is all mine. Kobus, I think you're absolutely right that in the think tank world, in the scholarly world, they have debunked the debt trap narrative. We haven't figured out 100% about what the Chinese are doing, but we're definitely getting away from, at least in the academic circles, that this is the kind of loans for you know, acquiring the port of Mombasa kind of, that simple narrative is is kind of debunked. It hasn't made it outside of that world, because I was just in Washington uh, this summer, and a lot of people are still talking about it in those kind of classic terms. So it hasn't kind of made jumped the bubble outside of the academic world, which is why it's so important that I think we have conversations with people like Xin Yue uh, to talk about this and to go one step further and to really kind of explore what the debt sustainability framework document is all about. It's an important step for the Chinese to do this. But the bottom line, and I, and I just, if I were sitting in front of a Chinese government official, this is what I would take them by the lapel and say, none of this matters until you have more transparency. None of it matters. All the green, all the sustainable, all the whatever it is you want to do, until there's more transparency, it will just add fuel to the fire. It gives the Americans more ammunition to criticize the Chinese. It makes the Chinese look evasive. Who knows what the Chinese are doing? I don't know. Maybe there is a debt trap or some kind of hidden political agenda. But until there is more transparency and less opacity and less evasiveness, people are going to wonder. And I think they're right to wonder because when you sit in, in Uganda right now, and even though the Chinese only own 18, 19% of the debt, that's still a lot of debt. And you're just not sure what's happening. You know? So what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it depends on, on who we mean by people, right? Because populations will definitely worry. And the, you know, I... The, the kind of criticism from from the US and the EU, you know, the, the, those criticisms do land. But at the same time, they, the main people that they would be criticizing and trying to influence would be African governments. And African governments, I think, are generally okay with the opacity. They don't mind it so much. Um, so, you That's know... True. I mean, they're as complicit in this as anybody else. Yes, and they, and they, they make the decisions. Um, yeah, so... What what um, for me, for me one of the big takeaways is that and and and, and again here yeah, it's this is like a you know kind of a big thing to say and I I'm, I'm not an economist so I'm sure there's lots of people who would be offering counter arguments but my feeling in in just seeing all of these it's like it's 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 not it's kind of seeing like almost like a tectonic shift um, that when I when I listen to these kind of this this the new language of risk coming from Chinese lenders. The new you kind of like focus on sustainability on um, the kind of everyone coming on the sustainable same together on the sustainable the debt sustainability page you know because it's exactly what you're hearing from Europe it's what you're hearing from Japan the Chinese are, are speaking a kind of a unified language there they're not really outliers um, my feeling is that this the the era that 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 the debt trap narrative is based in this era of like china is a big spending money bags you know bestriding the globe like throwing money left and right that's over i think um my feeling is that you know that sure chinese lending is going to go on but it's going to be become a lot more hard-nosed and you know kind of a lot more focused on 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 sustainability issues and i think this kind of african assumption that that um agri uh, mutambu articulated in a previous interview you know this just simple assumption that they had in kenya um during you know before the 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 third phase of the standard gauge railway was was rejected by china this assumption that oh china will always pay for everything you know like this obviously you get money from china who how else that I think is over. That like you know that 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 kind of easy spending, large amounts of, of financing with not too much kind of you know attention paid to to the actual sustainability of the payback. It seems to me like that kind of there, there's been a shift and that the, that era has ended. But I might be talking you know out of turn. Well, you know that old saying that if you know you owe the bank a million dollars, well that's your problem. But if you owe the bank a billion dollars, that's the bank's problem. Yeah. And I think there's some relevance here to that because, you know, I, I don't follow Venezuelan politics that closely, but the amounts that Venezuela owes is just so outstanding. I think it's somewhere north of $40 billion to the Chinese. And, you know, the Venezuelans, I think, can sit pretty because <laughs> that money ain't getting paid back. I mean, as far as I know, at least maybe in oil over the long term. But you're starting to see that a little bit in Africa where I get the sense that a lot of African governments – 
um, are starting to see debt forgiveness, debt relaxation, debt holidays coming from the Chinese. So maybe, you know, we don't, we just take on more debt and we kind of push the needle up as high as it can go till it becomes a Chinese problem. Yeah, but the... And I, I don't know if that's a, a gamble that they're taking or if it's, you know, but at some point it does become a Chinese problem. And we started after FOCAC, the last FOCAC. We started to hear rumblings in China about this. Remember, the economy in Beijing and in China is slowing. And the Chinese are going to start cutting back domestically. And the trade war with the United States is having a very big impact. Now, with Hong Kong in crisis, that's going to have an economic impact. So one has to wonder if, as you pointed out, those big checks are going to be written anymore because domestically, the leadership is under pressure not to be spending as much overseas because they're going to have to spend a lot domestically. Not taking into account, for example, the current pork crisis. Yeah, yeah. Where the Chinese are spending massive amounts on pork because of the African swine fever. So there's a lot of things that are plan- that are coming together here, which is why I love this, this this conversation on debt sustainability. It is a little bit wonky. You, you're not an economist. I'm not an economist. I am sure there's going to be some economists out there who are going to correct us on about 50 points here, but we would love to hear from you. Tell us what you think. This is a topic that we're going to continue to address over the next few months because I think we're at a turning point. Do you get a sense, Kobus, that we're, we're, there's a turning point coming in terms of how the Chinese are approaching debt and this issue as she was, as, as she knew I was talking about the criticisms from the West are landing. They're being heard in Beijing. And I wonder if, if there's going to, if we're going to see an, an actual change or is it just going to be more of the same? Um, my feeling is that we'll probably see a change, um, you know, a change towards, yeah, towards more, you know, more cautiousness um, and probably less spending. I think that the, what we really need to look out for is what the, what the, the commitment is going to be at the next FOCAC summit. Um, you know, I I would be, I would A, be very interested to see if they actually would, would have the kind of somewhat losing face moment of having a smaller commitment on paper than they had before, even though, you know, you know, we, we know that the math, there was some, some kind of math involved to, to actually get 2018 to the same 60 billion number as it was in 2015. Um, but, you know, or whether they might even go the Japanese route of, of like foregoing a big number being announced at all. Um, you know, that I think is going to be a really important indicator. Yeah, that's also what the Americans have done as well. They don't do those numbers either. So, yeah, this is this is going to be a fascinating topic to watch. It's going to change. I think it's also tied in with a lot of the issues that we talked about with Hong Kong, with the U.S., with the pork. These are all connected. They're, they're all part of the same issues because, obviously, the leadership in Beijing is confronting all of these different issues at the same time, and Africa is not immune from all of that. So we would love to hear from you, uh, to hear what you think. Again, economists out there, please kind of shed some light, share your thoughts, uh, you know, were some of the ideas that we raised today on on point or did we miss the mark? If we missed the mark, we would love to hear from you. Uh, share us on Facebook. You can email Kobus and I directly. Uh, I'm at eric at chinaafricaproject.com. Kobus is at kobus at chinaafricaproject.com. We are getting back to emails within about 24 hours. And uh, sometimes they're very, very long. <laughs> Kobus is always amazed that I'll write these massive kind of dissertations back to people who, uh, who email me. So brace yourself if you email me. You're going to get a response and sometimes a very thoughtful, detailed response. But we always love to hear from you. So Kobus and I will be back again next week with another edition of the China in Africa podcast. For Kobus van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China and Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com. Music